everybody.
you, Jesus. Praise God. I think we got some of the residue of prayer meeting last night still in there. We, uh, I, I love that song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Look full of his wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And uh, what, a, what a wonderful thought. Uh, the Bible said actually that the glory of God is hid in the face of Jesus Christ. Therefore, if you want to see God's glory, you've got to seek the faith of the face of Jesus. You've got to, you've got to seek his face, saints. And, uh, and in, in his face, you will find God's wonderful glory. We, uh, I, I want to continue. I know I talked a little bit about Sunday, then last night about uh, families. I want to talk a little bit more about that tonight. Um, how many of us know that the family unit on earth is supposed to be a reflection of Christ's relationship with the church. Um, the Bible said, uh, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And so ultimately, uh, the, 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 the family unit should reflect uh, the relationship that Christ has with his church. And I want you to go with me to Ephesians 5 and verse 22. God loves order, saints. He is a God of order. When you look at the solar systems, when you just look at our, our, our Milky Way galaxy, and, and you look at uh, our planetary system that we're in, and you see how God has so ordered everything. Uh, God has put everything in order. Uh, the earth spins just as fast as it needs to. Uh, it doesn't rotate any slower. It doesn't rotate any faster. But the exact speed of, of, of the earth's rotation is exactly what it needs to be to, for gravity to be exactly what we need it to be so that things don't lose gravity and so that gravity doesn't crush us. Uh, our exact distance from the sun uh, is the exact amount of distance that we need to be in order to not cook from the sun, but also to not freeze. Everything that God does is order. Uh, if you look at the human anatomy, everything is in order. And, and we get sick when something within that anatomy, something within our body, begins to rebel against the order that it was created for. When it begins to rebel against the purpose it was created for, then we become sick. Uh, in fact, cancer really is just cells working in rebellion against the body. Uh, so, so everything God has created has an order in it, everything. The church is no different. The home is no different. God loves Order. In fact, the Bible says that we are to do all things decently and in order. Order is God's personality. It is who he is. Everything he has done is for order. And so here in Ephesians 5 and verse 22, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. I think it is necessary to... To, to, to point out again, he said, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. I don't think it's accidental that he wrote it like that. <laughs> For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. When we look at this beautiful reflection of Christ and the church, when we look at this beautiful reflection of, of, of how the church is to submit to Christ, how, how are we to submit to Christ but completely? How are we to submit to Christ but totally? We are to totally and completely, as the church, submit ourselves to Christ. We are to be in obedience to Christ. I know that that's hard for us to, to fathom sometimes, 
in our generation, but that is what Christ requires of us. He requires submission and obedience. Now, submission is not something that a husband can beat from his wife. It is not something he can manipulate from his wife. It is not something he can coerce from his wife. Submission and obedience is something that that wife has to see as her gift to give unto her husband. Just as much as the church has to see it our gift to give our obedience to Christ. The Bible, says, the Bible said that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. And so when we look at the church and the family, they are both to project the same image, the image of Christ's relationship with his church. And so ultimately, he's telling us here that as Christ, as the church is subject unto Christ, so the wives should be subject unto their husbands in everything. That's a powerful statement, saints. There, it leaves no ambiguity. That's a powerful statement. He says in everything. And so when is submission found? Is submission found? So Christ comes to me and says, Jared, I want you to do this. I don't like what he's asking me to do. And so I say, well, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to do that. That's not what I want to do. Then he comes to me a week later and says, Jared, I want you to do this. And I say, oh, that's something I want to do. That's something I would like to do. And so therefore, yes, Lord, I'll do that immediately. Do you think I'm submitted at all? No. no, because submission is not found in agreement. Submission is found in disagreement. It is, listen, a husband has no right to ask his wife to do something immoral, to do something unethical, or to do something that would compromise her faith. He has no right for that. That is, that is not within his rights scripturally. Because Christ has never, if I love my wife, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, Christ has never asked me to do anything immoral. He's never asked me to do anything unethical. He's never asked me to do something that would personally harm myself physically. I don't have a right as a husband to make demands upon my wife that Christ would not make upon the church. And so before I, as a husband, make demands upon my wife, what do I have to first reference? Would Christ make the church do this? Would Christ demand the church do this? Would Christ require the church to do this? If I cannot answer that question with yes, this is something that Christ would ask, then as a husband, I have overstepped my bounds to ask my wife to do something that Christ would not even require of his own church. Because the, the house is to be a reflection of Christ's relationship with the church. Now, as a spouse, if my husband says, honey, I need you to do this, this, and this, and it rankles me, it makes me angry, it frustrates me because I don't want to do that. Am I within my biblical right to reject what he's asked me to do because I don't feel personally like that's something I want to do? Absolutely not. That would be the same thing as the church looking to Christ and saying, Lord, I know you have made this reasonable demand, but it is not something that I want to do. It is not in the purview of my plans. And so therefore, I'm not doing it. So sisters, before you say no, you must ask yourself, would the church be able to tell Christ no if he asked this? Would the church be able to deny that request or even those instructions if Christ gave them to us? Because the home is to be a reflection of Christ's relationship with the church. Y'all are so quiet tonight. Bless your little hearts. Bless your hearts. Order is a blessing. Order is never a curse. Order appears to be a curse to those who want rebellion. So if I am a man 
and I don't want to obey Christ. I don't want to lead and guide my family as the priest of my home, as the man of God who is in spiritual responsibility over my home. I will find everything to do and I will find every distraction to engage in order to never have to take that role on. Then we can understand why in the world our wives are frustrated and angry and our children are completely ungoverned. Why is that? Because I have determined that I'm not going to put my authority over my family that Christ has given me because I don't want to do it. I don't necessarily believe it's because men have overbearing wives. I, I believe it's because they don't want the responsibility. I don't care how overbearing your wife is. If you take that responsibility, God will give grace. God will give help. It is because men themselves are in rebellion against God. I don't want to pray in my home. Don't want to, I don't want to read the Bible in my home. I don't, want to, I don't want to grow up. We have got way too many men who are still acting like teenagers that need to grow up. I told you all this weekend, throw your game systems away. Sister Shauna, do I play video games? I do not play video games. You want to know why? Because I'm a man now. Every once in a while, Sam will say, Dad, can you come play with me? And I might do that. But I determined a long time ago that the only thing that a game system can do is distract me from my responsibility to my family. I can remember before I was ever married, when I was single and I was an adult and I was living at home, I could get on that game system and I could play and all of a sudden, I come to reality, and it's 5 o'clock in the morning. I started at 5 o'clock in the evening, and I have played for 12 hours. But the Bible said, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I don't need toys anymore. We're not boys. We don't need toys. Amen. Praise the Lord. You say, Pastor, I don't have a game system. Oh, but well, what's your toy? Come on, somebody. Your pet car, your favorite motorcycle. Come on, somebody. Uh, all boys have toys. But when we become men, we put away our toys. And from that point on, it becomes about us maturing and growing up in the Lord and making decisions because, brothers, you must understand, God is not going to charge your wife in the, in the resurrection for the lack of spiritual leadership in your home. He's going to look at you and say, I gave you that job. Why didn't you do it? And do not throw the excuse to him that Adam did and say, Lord, the woman thou gavest me. That is not going to work. God may very well, if you're having trouble right now with your spouse, if they're overbearing, if they're continually in rebellion, that may be God chastising you. That may be God chastening you. What God is saying is, do you want to know how rebellion feels? Well, you're in rebellion against me. Now, let, I'm going to let your wife be in rebellion against you and see what you think about it. It could be very well that the moment you give yourself completely over to the Lord, that God will take that spirit of rebellion off your spouse. Amen. 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 Now, if both parents are in rebellion against the Lord because the husband's in rebellion against Christ and the woman is in rebellion against her husband, God may very well, well, I don't want to say God will, by, by sure reason, your children will be out of control. They will be undisciplined and rebellious. They will be defiant. Now, all children have that in them. But God will allow that to magnify just to chastise you. Because I'm going to tell you something. There's not a man that has got any sanity about him 
whose whole household is in complete rebellion that will not fall on his face at some point under conviction and say, God, I have messed this thing up. I have been in rebellion against you. I have been distracted with things that do not pertain to my household. Look at the shape my home is in. Look what I have done. I have been a complete failure. But God, I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm asking you to cleanse me. I'm asking you to touch my mind. Help me, Lord God, to be obedient from here. Because if there is rebellion from the husband all the way to the children, it will be first the obedience of the husband that brings about, finally, the obedience of the children. Why? Because the Lord wants the, Lord wants the families of the church to reflect his relationship with his church. He wants us to be he wants us to be an example so that when people look at our homes our homes should not be in chaos. I'm going to tell you something sister Chandra and I have had four little bitty ones running through the house at some point. We have but they need to know there's a time to be quiet. They need to know there's a time to sit down. Come on, somebody. When our children were children, we taught them that when company came over, they were not going to be the center of attention and we weren't going to scream over them in order to have conversation. My mother taught me when I went into someone's house, I was there to be seen and not heard. And I, was, I did not speak unless an adult spoke to me. That was order. That was honor. That was respect. Now I'm going to tell you, I didn't raise all of the issues and some type of personality disorder and the fact that nobody cared about me or one day hear what I had to say because I was unimportant. No, I wasn't unimportant. My parents showed me when I was with them that I was important. But they also showed me that when other adults were in the room, I was not. And I thought it was very powerful. This generation is so fake. My goodness gracious. There's so much fake going on in this generation. We take to social media and we present things that are absolutely false. We know we're lying about it, but we want everybody to think that our family is the perfect family with four kids, a dog, a house, and I believe that. Even though we know that we are in the Adams family house, Uncle Fester lives in the basement, amen, and Lurch is running around somewhere. We understand that. <laughs> yes, Lord, it's absolutely the truth. But we're trying our best to project a social image that is false. And so, Chandra, in the article, there's this mother whose hair is all ratted and, 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 and who doesn't look like a million bucks. But her children are taken care of. Her children, she's spending time with her children. In the next case, there was a young lady that took her child to the pool. And all the child wanted to do was get in the pool. But the mother had to have her whatever latest Michael Kors pool bag with her Michael Kors towels and her Michael Kors swimsuit and her child in its Michael Kors swimsuit. And the child's just sitting there saying, Mommy, I just want to get in the pool. But the mother lays everything out perfectly. Puts the child down on the towel. And the child said, Mommy, I just want to get in the pool. And the mother gets the child, puts only its feet in the water, stands there with the child and takes multiple selfies. But the child never gets in the pool because the mother's spending all of her time to project an image that is not true. And that is the generation we are living in. My goodness sakes, I will not go into detail the, the, the attire this person was wearing. But they came out to the beach while we were out there. And they stood for 35 minutes making the most ridiculous pictures.
pictures that you've ever seen. <laughs> We're all sitting there like, like everybody around us is just looking at it like this is you got to be kidding me. But that's the generation we live in. The smartphone has made us incredibly stupid. Come on, somebody. It makes us look ridiculous. It makes us look self-centered and self-absorbed. That's what it makes it look, makes us look like. Come on, nobody needs to see that many pictures of anybody. Praise God. Let me tell you something. We got pictures once a year as a family. Thank you, Jesus. And normally it was in that stupid wine glass with those bubbles all around it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You remember them old pictures? No, y'all don't. I'm dating myself. But that's what we used to get them in. But we would have to go. We didn't, we didn't have a professional camera. We're all carrying around now professional cameras. Professional grade cameras are in our hand. But back in the day, nobody had that but photographers. So we actually had to get dressed up and we had to go down to the photographer and we had to get to their studio and we had to sit and take pictures. There were no selfies back in the day. Nobody was posting a half a million pictures on Facebook every week. And you know what? We had things we were getting accomplished. We actually were doing stuff. We were communicating with people. We have all of these devices of communication. And all it is served to do is make us self-centered. So we do that in our homes as well. Children of God, I'm going to ask you. Stop projecting images. Just stop. Just put that all to an end. It's really vanity is what it is. It's not godly. It's vanity. Stop projecting images. You want to use social media? Great. Use it to testify of the goodness of God. But don't try to project a false image that people honestly, if they knew you would sit there and go, that's not who they are. Amen. Stop taking so many selfies. I'm going to ask you to go down to one a week. Just one a week. I'm asking you. I'm challenging you right now. Some of y'all are already about to go into a whole seizure. <laughs> I'm asking you one selfie a week, please. Let's make this about Jesus. Let's make this about the Lord. Let's make this about the goodness of God in our life. Let's stop projecting ourselves. John the Baptist said, if I decrease, he will increase. But we're doing that in our homes. We're projecting images of our homes that are not true. We're projecting images of our life that are not true. Come on, somebody. Everybody sees the pictures where all your family is smiling. But that's after the 15 minutes that you forced your children to do it. You forced your wife to do it. You pled with her, I will take you and get you a purse. Honey, please, honey, just smile. We'll, we'll go get you a steak afterward. Listen, stop doing all that stuff. We're lying. Honestly, we're lying. It is not true. If you are projecting a false public image, you are a liar. And the Bible said all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. Still water runs deep. Our homes are to be a reflection of Christ. You know how that's going to happen when we put our phones down. When we put our tablets down. And we actually start to get down to business. I never had a phone until I was maybe 17 or 18. I think I was 18 actually. When I actually had my first phone. I never had that growing up as a child. My mom would say, you boys go play. And when you see the street lights start to come on, you come home. That was how she contacted us. Well, we live in a horrible age now. Like you can't let your children outside. That's not true. Statistically, there were more children being abducted in the 80s and 90s than there are right now. This is the truth. That's a lie of the devil. It is. Well, I'm not going to do it. Well, then take your children outside. Let them play. We wonder why our children are, are, are just spastic. Most of the behavioral disorders that are being put on our children is because we are bottling them up in places where they need to expend their energy. If 
you would let them run around outside, they would probably sit down at the dinner table still. Praise God. Amen. But we need order in our church, our homes. We need that desperately. We need order. When, when we usurp authority in our homes... What we're doing is we're, we're showing the world this is how things work between Christ and his church. We usurp authority. And so as Hannah, I thought Hannah, her testimony was so powerful Sunday night and it was very real. If Hannah, if, if Ken was to discipline the boys and Hannah come back, you don't have to pay attention to that. You don't have to listen to that. What do you think that reflects on Christ and the church? So that means when Christ chastises people because they're in rebellion, we would come behind and say, don't worry about it. that's not how, that's not what Christ actually does. Don't that's not that's just life. And when we do that to people, we're usurping the authority of Christ in their life and they never change because they can never receive correction. And anyone who cannot receive correction is a bastard, and not a son, which means that God is not their father. And I'm going to tell you something, saints, if we're truly born again, we'll take correction. Because we're children of our father. And if God is our father, we'll take it. We'll deal with correction. And so why would I allow, why would I allow myself in my home to become a usurper of authority over my spouse? Listen, it can be both ways. Husbands can, can. We can take the authority away from the mothers in the house. We can do the exact same thing. The exact same thing. We can take the authority. And because mom and dad are sitting there fighting over who knows how to raise the children best, the children are not being raised. I'll say that one more time. Because mom and dad are sitting trying to fight over who knows better how to raise the children, the children are left being unraised. At some point, you're going to have to just shut that argument down and go raise your kids. Yeah. I've watched women unintentionally emasculate boys because they wouldn't let their father discipline them. And I'm going to tell you something, sisters. It is just as impossible for a man to raise a woman as it is for a woman to raise a man. That's the reason why with single mothers in the church, the men have to step up and take even a greater part in the life of the boys. Are you hearing what I'm saying? They're doing their best, but they got to have men in their lives. It's just the way it is. Men have got to raise them. The boys will never, ever become men until a man raises them. And unfortunately, we got a lot of boys in their 20s and 30s that have never, ever been raised. They're still boys because they've never really had a man. And I'm not demeaning them at all. It's not their fault. You can't blame someone for not operating in information they don't have. You can't, you can't condemn them for not operating in information they don't have. The problem is oftentimes when they're adults now and they don't have to listen to anybody... Oftentimes it becomes more difficult to bring correction into the life of those boys because now they're adults and ain't nobody going to tell them what to do. I found a long time ago that I don't know everything. And I have got older men in my life, much older than me, that help me when I come to a place I don't know what I'm talking about. They'll either call me on it or I'll call them because of it. Nobody knows everything. But I was telling Shonda the other day, I said, one thing I'm finding is, and I'm going to tell you, the more younger people that come into this, especially in their 20s uh, and, 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 and in late teens, we're going to have to parent people. So church, you better get yourself ready because this job is about to get real. We're going to have to parent younger. We're going to have to, you're all going to have to mother young women. We're going to have to father young men. Because they, we've had a whole generation that has spent so much time in broken homes and broken situations whose families have been completely destroyed. That we have a lot of boys that don't know how to be men and we have a lot of girls that don't know how to be women. But they're in grown adult bodies. And the church is going to have to get some gusto about it. We're going to have to get some serious 
compassion in our heart and say, look, I know you don't have, know how to act like a man. I'm not demeaning you, but I'm here to help you to know how a man treats his wife, how a man treats his children, how a man presents himself, walks. Come on, somebody. How many young men do we have outside of these walls that do not know how to be anything but boys, but they are in positions of responsibility that can only be filled by men, and they're making messes of, of, of parenting, they're making messes of their homes, come on, they're producing children outside of wedlock by the droves because they are in position as men, but they are in maturity as boys. And it is the same way with young women. So therefore, the church must start taking its responsibility seriously. God's given to us this generation. He said, I will give unto you the heathen for your inheritance. God has brought us into the kingdom for such a time as this. So as men of the church, are we maturing? Are we growing in our maturity? Are we putting away childish things? Are we walking away from mentalities? Are we emotionally stable? Are we emotionally tough? Let me tell you something, brothers. God gave, God gave women a special touch emotionally that allows them to nurture children in a level that we cannot ourselves. But God in place of that has given men to be strong. I call upon you young men because you are strong. Does not mean that we need to be emotionally. Uh, it does not mean that we need to be. Uh, uh, how do I want to say it? That we need to evacuate uh, ourselves emotionally. That we, need to, that we need to dismiss ourselves emotionally. It doesn't mean that. That's not what that means. What it means is, is that we can't be little boys in a man's body so that every time adversity comes, we fall apart. You know how a man stands up against adversity? Doesn't mean we ignore it. We acknowledge it. We understand it's there. But you know what we do? We get out of bed. We put our pants on. We put our work shirts on. We lace our boots up and we keep moving forward. We keep pounding forward. Because listen, if we'll trust the Lord, if we'll take this to the Lord, and if we won't allow this to hinder our forward movement, God will bring us on the other side of this. He will make a way where there seems to be no way. The only way for the enemy to stop men is if we succumb to the manipulation of the moment. We have got to look at the moment and say, hmm, wonder what's coming out of this for me. Because on the other side of this, I'm going to be a better man. On the other side of this, I'm going to be a wiser man. Man. On the other side of this, I'm going to be a stronger man because we know that all things work together for the good to them who love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. Yes. Amen. God needs strong men in homes. Your wife should not have to bear up under the emotional baggage of a boy who was never raised. But at the same time, it doesn't take a strong woman to emasculate a man. A strong woman will encourage a man to be a better man, a greater man, a stronger man. A woman who is weak mentally and emotionally will emasculate men because she's terrified of their strength. She's terrified. Because honestly, there's a battle for King of the Hill. So in order for me to stay as top dog in the house, I have to emasculate him. So I make statements like, I got three kids in the house instead of two. That woman's emasculating her husband. That's like the church saying, hmm, our, our, our husband, nothing but a child. It's just a child. Well, he's not. Well, neither is yours. Well, he acts like one. Start praying. Start asking God to grow him up. 
But don't you ever open your mouth to emasculate your husband to call him a child. That makes you a child molester. Praise God. You'll get that one tomorrow. Amen. Oh, glory. I know that was tight, but it was absolutely right. What are you doing marrying a child? Praise God. That's not a reflection of Christ in the church. That's actually a reflection of the world. And what we're trying to do, listen, we can be holiness or hell all we want, but if we refuse to get the world out of our home, it means nothing. It's just rhetoric. If our homes are out of control, I could stand up here and I could preach holiness to you all day long. But if my wife is out of control, if my children are out of control, it means nothing. It's, that's the reason why the Bible said that a bishop had, and, or just a deacon. That he's, his wife has to be sober and grave and she has to be uh, 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 chaste and she has to be a keeper of a home and taking care of her children. And, and his wife must be in sub subjection to him. When that is not the case, he doesn't have the right to wait the tables in the church. Why? Because it is a poor reflection of Christ in the church. And Christ is not going to permit people to be in leadership in the church who are poorly reflecting his relationship with his church. And so Sister Chandra was running over me constantly. I wouldn't even deserve to be up here. If Xander was mocking me and, and violent toward me, I wouldn't even deserve to be up here. If I told him to go do something and he looked at me and said, I'm not doing it. You go do it yourself. I don't deserve to be up here. Come on, somebody. If that was the case, I didn't, wouldn't even deserve to wait the tables in the church. Why? Because it doesn't reflect Christ in his church. Say, so prove this. All right. I've already quoted the scripture. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Which means anything that you demand of your wife, any demands you make on your wife should be able to be looked at between Christ and the church. And that demand should be reasonable. I know that's tight, same, but it's so true. That's good. Why? That he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. Listen, the word of God is there for, to, is there for us to clean up every area of our life. Yes, the word of God will wash our mouths. It will. It will. The word of God will wash our eyes. It will, it will wash our spirits. The Bible said, cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The word of God will wash us. And it does. And that's the reason why your lives change. Your lives change because the word of God is washing you. Your lives change because the blood of Christ has purged your dead conscience to serve the living God. That's why your lives have changed. And so what about our homes? Yes, you may not cuss, but is our home in order? Yes, you may not fornicate, but is our home in order? Yes, you may no longer listen to filthy music, but is our home in order? Yes, you may no longer watch uh, uh, horror movies and perverted movies, but is our homes in order? Because God wants to wash our homes. God wants to cleanse our homes. Why? Because he wants the family and the church to be a reflection of his relationship with his church. He wants people to look at our homes and say, oh, that's how Christ treats his church. You ought to witness people. Listen, I could be witnessing to everybody that I come into contact with at the cash register. But if my home is out of order, my witness is not in, it, it's, 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 it's completely rendered inadequate and unreasonable. Because it's God washing my home. And we're all needing to ask these questions. Verse 27, he brings it right back to the church that he might present unto himself a glorious church. 
not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their own, their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man has yet hated his own flesh. Which means that if you don't hate yourself, how can you hate your wife? Because for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. If you hate your wife, you cannot love yourself. And if you love yourself, how can you hate your wife? He wants to purge us. He really does. That's the reason why our home should have order in it. Come on, somebody. I shouldn't have messes all over my home. My home shouldn't be in utter chaos. Come on, somebody. My dishes shouldn't be piled up to the ceiling. My laundry shouldn't be three weeks out. Come on, somebody. People shouldn't have to wipe the crust off the seat to sit on the toilet. You look at me strange, but I'm telling you, I've been there, done that, got my T-shirt. I walked in there with holy water, sprinkling it all over everything. I mean, I was claiming the name of Jesus over the toilet seat. Come on, over the bathtub. Praise God. <laughs> but these things are not to be in the house of a child of God. Somebody said, well, I don't have the nicest house. You don't have to not the nicest of anything to keep it clean. <laughs> you may not have the Taj Mahal. <clears throat> Amen. You may have the little shack on the backside of the mountain. Keep it clean. Keep it washed. Amen. People should not have to do a personal safari to walk through your yard. Amen. Keep your yard clean. Why? Because I'm reflecting Christ in his church. Amen. I want people to be able to walk onto my property and say, that's a child of God right there. Does not the world take care of their stuff like that? Why should we as children of God are trying to reflect God's order do any less? So when I look at my yard, when I look at my house, when I look at how I treat my wife or I treat my husband, how I'm raising my children, does it reflect Jesus Christ? As a man, and we have a whole generation with it. I talked about it Sunday, but it's just disgusting to me, men that won't work. I cannot stand it. I cannot stand a man who won't provide for his family. I realize that people have disabilities and, and that's fine. I understand all of that. There, there are those situations. I get that. But a man who can and won't, I, it just disgusts me. I can't stand it. Can't stand it. I mean, have every excuse in the world why they can't work. Every excuse in the world why they've had 25 jobs since last September. That's a lazy man. It's just a lazy man. It's just what it is. Say whatever you want. It's just a lazy man. But the Bible said that a man who will not provide for his own, especially that of his own household, is denied of faith and is worse than an infidel. And we have churches filled with men who refuse to do any work, who will not provide for themselves or their family. They're not going to do it. Saints of God, they're not even at the faith. God has rejected them as infidels. Why? Because it doesn't reflect Christ in the church. Because God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So when I look at my spouse or my family, and I'm not saying you have to go work a nine to five job. There are men that can't do that. Brother Earl, he, he probably had at points nine to five, maybe. I don't know, probably a lot longer than that. But he was an entrepreneur. He had his own business. So his schedule varied. I'm not saying you have to go out and get a static job. But you ought to be able to provide for your family. If you're on disability, you're on disability. But I'm talking about men who 
can take care of their family. Men who are providing should be providing for their family. You should be give, bringing in adequate uh, uh, finances to take care of every need that your family has. I'm going to give you a little story. All I ever wanted was full-time ministry. Honestly, it's all I ever wanted. God, I wanted full-time ministry. But when I married Sister Shonda, she had three children. Then we eventually had Xander. <laughs> I wasn't even able to draw a check from the church at this point. So I could have stood up in this pulpit and preached, been in my office every day and studied. But that would have never pleased God. God would have looked past my preaching and my study time. But my wife would be able to stand with all honesty and tell you without a shadow of a doubt that since we were married, her husband has worked and provided for, the, for his family without any fail. When the church went into its crisis and we had no money and, and we were bigger. Listen, don't. Don't think for a moment that I was sitting in my house thinking, ooh, I got some leisure time here. You know what I was doing? I was putting in resumes. I was going after jobs. I finally got a job delivering parts with Advanced Auto. I didn't sit there and think, my goodness, I was a project manager before this. I ain't driving and delivering parts. No, my family needed to eat. And my primary responsibility was to make sure their needs were met. And when the ministry could not provide for it, I did like Paul did. Paul went and made tents. I went and delivered auto parts because I knew that it was my job as a man of God to make sure my family's needs were met and not because Uncle Sam was paying our rent and buying our groceries, but because I was gainfully employed taking care of my family's needs. Somebody said, well, there are people on disability. I know there are, and I'm fine with that. That's why we have it for people who are dis disabled. But not just some joker that has decided he doesn't want to work or he's got better plans for his life. And so the government can house his children and can pay for their food. That is not God's will for us. So as men, you know what we do? We say, Lord, God in heaven, let me be a reflection of you. And you have provided all my needs. David said, I have been young and I am now old. And I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread. Brothers, our order in God is to provide for our family. It is to take care of their needs. And when I'm not doing that, I am showing the world another Jesus and I'm preaching to them another gospel that word's got to wash me of laziness it's got to wash me of childishness until when I wake up in the morning and I see my family is struggling and suffering at my hand I repent right there I, listen let me tell you something there were times that I sat on the side of my bed because I couldn't provide for my family. It wasn't that I didn't want to. I just couldn't get a job at that point. And I sat and wept and cried on the side of my bed. I, I contemplated killing myself somehow accidentally so that my family could collect my insurance money. Because my primary responsibility was to take care of their needs. And when I see men that don't give a flying flip about taking care of their family's needs and they let somebody else do it because they've got other plans, I can't stomach those kind of men. Because they're not reflections of Christ. Because Christ has never denied my needs because he has better plans. He's never denied the things that I need from him because he doesn't feel like getting up and getting the job done. The devil is a liar. So brothers, remember, even at the very moment of you providing for your family, you're supposed to be reflecting Christ. Help us, Lord. My wife is not responsible to provide for herself. I know men. Listen, I work and take care of myself. What's wrong with you? You get up and go do something. You get up and you get a job. <laughs> Please show me that in the word. Show me that in the word. But that doesn't give you an excuse, sisters, to sit at home and watch soap opera while your husband's out working and he comes home to no meal and to a dirty house. Because you're just, 
You are, you are acting just like a lazy man who won't work. God looks at you in the same frame. You're not being a virtuous woman. You're a lazy woman who's expecting your husband to go out and pay the bills, but you have no responsibility to the home. Your testimony is in vain. Your witness is in vain. It means nothing. Because you're reflecting another Jesus, another God. But brothers, don't you dare demand your wife go to work. Now, sister, don't you dare demand him to buy you Michael Kors. To put you in a Mercedes Benz. To buy you fancy jewelry. You be satisfied with what he can bring home and thank God for it. But when husbands put demands on their wives to go to work because that I've got my bills, you got your bills. No, brother, you married her. You took upon the responsibility of taking care of her, and it is your God called assignment. And if you don't, you can you can shama topo shataraba idabo shatarara. God's not hearing your tongues. God's listen, your tongue is getting no further than your tongue. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You can dance, shout, preach, turn backflips if you want, but your prayers go no further than your face because you have denied the faith that is worse than an infidel. Amen. I th we just got to start saying this stuff now. It, I'm done. I'm done with it. I'm telling you. The, the homes are so out of order. And it's causing a poor reflection on Christ. And it's not fair. Well, you go to work. I got to work every day. You go to work. You're her provider. You go to work. Amen. Amen. And if you've got children, I'm pleading with you to please don't put them in daycares if you can't, if you don't have to. Well, we have to. Have you looked at your budget and see what you can cut back on so that you don't have to? God did not allow you to birth children so someone else could raise them. And raising them is not getting them after you get off work and putting them to bed. That's not raising children. Raising children is the mother should be in the home every day, all day. If it is possible that you can make sacrifices and not have the best of everything. Maybe you have to cut back. Maybe instead of you shopping at Burke, you have to go and shop at Salvation Army. I don't know, never, 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 never. Is it more important that you project, project a false public image or that you raise your children? I'm just asking. What's more important? What's more important? Those children at some point are going to come. They're going to raise up and be adults and they're going to reflect how you raise them. They're going to raise their children. Let me just say it this way. Are you comfortable with your children raising their children like you're raising your children? God did not. They're orphans at this point. They just have your home to live in. At some point, mothers are going to have to step up into their place and be what they are and be so thankful to God that that's what they are. We live in a society that absolutely demeans women if they're not career women. The greatest thing you'll ever do is raise the next generation. When you look at your children, you do not know who that's going to be. But I can guarantee you they won't be it if you don't raise them. Or they will have to go through hell in order to be that person because they were never raised. I want us to honestly take some serious introspection. Do I want or a mother? Well, I want to be a career woman. Too bad you're a mother. We should have considered those things before we had children. Once you have children, you have lost your right to be a career woman, and now you're a mother. And that doesn't make you less of a person. And it doesn't make you weak. And it doesn't make you icky. And it doesn't make you some failure or flunky. You are a mother. What greater thing could you possibly be? Some woman raised Abraham Lincoln. 
Some woman raised Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Some woman raised the Apostle Paul. Some woman raised the Apostle Peter. Come on. Some woman did. Some woman raised Timothy. Some woman raised Stephen. Some woman raised George Washington. Come on, somebody. Some woman raised Nelson Mandela. Some woman raised Martin Luther King Jr. Some woman did that. And when that man went into his purpose, it was a result of a woman who stood behind him as a mother and raised him, raised her. What greater calling could you have? So you become a CEO and your children are twofold the children of hell. What have you accomplished? Nothing. You failed as a mother. You failed as a parent. You failed your, you failed your son because you were seeking success. Not realizing that success came from your womb. I remember Bishop T.D. Jakes was talking um, at a men's conference. And I was there. And of course, I know that Bishop Jakes has went sideways on a lot of his stuff. But at this point, God was really using the man. And he said his mother would tell him all the time. His name is Thomas Dexter. She would say, Thomas, I had dreams when I was a little girl. When I'd sit up under my bed and read my Bible, I would have dreams that I would be standing in arenas in front of thousands and preaching. His mother never, ever did. But what God was giving her was the vision for the boy that once would. Glory to God. The greatest calling a woman can ever attain to is a mother. Because you are raising the next generation of hopefully, prayerfully, God called men and women that will take this gospel to another generation. What greater calling could you have? What greater assignment could be on your life? So I'm asking you to really consider these things. Can we cut back? Can we, can we do with less? So that our children could have more. Because having more is not in bicycles. And having more. Because let me tell you something. Bicycles rust. Toy cars decay. Amen. Amen. Play-Doh gets all mixed up and you can't use it no more. <laughs> Unless you want a Dalmatian that's pink, green, and yellow. <laughs> Which is fine, I guess. All those things go away. The thing that will never leave that child is the impact that its mother did or did not have on its life. Even when the church mothers these people coming in or the church father these people coming in, you know that you know what we will not be able to take away from them? The memory of the parent that should have and didn't. We that know better ought to know better. I really want to talk about this I wanted to talk about this tonight because order is a reflection of God's. His whole personality, who he is. Somebody said God is love. Well, that is an attribute of God. But God is a God of order. Everything he does is ordered. From Genesis all the way to Revelation is ordered. There's nothing that God does by happenstance. Everything has its order, its place, its design. That is exactly how our homes should work. As ministers of the gospel, and I know, good Lord God, now we've got Apostle Janet this and Bishop Wilma that. And, but we've got women who are pursuing ministry and leaving their ministry to their children. And their children are never raised because all they're doing is their ministry. Listen, I'm going to tell you, saints. I failed as a father to my older children 
Because while I should have been in their life, I was pursuing ministry with everything that I was. I should have been ministering to them with all I had, but I was actually pursuing ministry with all I had. I was doing, I failed them. And I can remember being in Houston, Texas at a meeting. And the convicting power of the Holy Ghost sitting on me so powerfully about that. I wasn't even thinking about it. I'm just sitting there waiting for the meeting to start. And all of a sudden, God's like, you've been a horrible father. Huh. You failed your children. You were not there for them like you should have been. It wasn't the enemy condemning me. It was God convicting me. You were pursuing your success. Ignoring your children. My goodness. I mean, that hit me like a ton of bricks. I had to borrow Brother Deloy's car and go back to the hotel. I missed the whole service. In the hotel on my knees, by my bedside, weeping and crying, asking God to forgive me for the failure that I had been. And one by one, to every one of my adult children, I sent them a personalized message Asking them to forgive me for what I had not been in their life. And for allowing the ministry to overtake me to the place that I forgot I was first their father. And you can ask all three of my older children. They may still have the messages. And I watch people just letting their children go to hell in a handbasket while pursuing ministry. You're going to regret it. Oh God, you're going to regret it. You're going to regret it so bad. You know what? Your children are going to hate the church. Because it took their parent away from them. Well, I take my children to the church with me. If you're not involved in their life as their parent, they will not care that you were their pastor. God, help us to do things in order. Help us as fathers and husbands. I don't have any children yet. Well, this is a good time for you to come to the place of maturity that when you. I just want to be a friend to my children when they're. It was my friend. My parents are my friends now. But until I was grown, they were my parents. And we've got too many parents trying to be friends. And it doesn't work like that. You are codependent and you need God to heal you. If you have to have those children to be your friends, you've got a codependent need to God to get deep down in your spirit and say, oh, no, they're not your friends. They're your children. Your husband is your friend. Amen. Your sisters at church, your brothers at church, those are your friends. But right now, these are your children. You don't need them to be your friends. They need their mother and their father. They can have their friends at the park. They can have their friends in school. But when they come home, they need their parents. Now, the relationship between my parents has totally evolved. And many of you can say the same thing. It's not that parent-child relationship anymore. I'm an adult now, so therefore it's a friendship. I honor them as my parents. I've never changed that. I'll never change that. But I don't look at them as mommy and daddy anymore. It's the reason why we have 35-year-olds living in their parents' basements. Because they've never evolved from mommy and daddy to dad and mom. So that father, mother. Because they've never grown up. Please, parents, don't ever look at your children as your friends. They're not your friends. This is my best friend. Go, go to the Walmart and find somebody at the cash register and talk to them until you can go get lunch, okay? Don't look at, don't make, don't put that on your child. Don't put that on your child. You're, 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 you're asking them to be the best friend to an adult? I know, put adult baggage on little children who cannot handle it emotionally. And they grow up emotional misfits because they were crushed emotionally as children trying to bear up under the weight of their parents' issues. Quit looking at your children as your
your best friends. They are not your friends. They are your responsibility. They are your children, but they are not your friends. Saints, I know these kind of things are hard. But if we'll let the word correct us, right. our homes will get where they're supposed to be. Yes. Our lives will get where they're supposed to be. Yeah. Our relationships will get where they're supposed to be. Sister Chandra and I went out of town yesterday. We had a little hiccup in the morning, people acting up. But we got through that, came home to pray later on that night. But we were celebrating our anniversary because our youth conference... And uh, we didn't. We didn't even. We didn't even go get an ice cream. <laughs> we didn't have time for nothing. So we decided to go out of town yesterday. And I just told her, I was like, we're not spending enough time together. We're really not. We are so tied up in everything that we're not spending enough time together. Why? Because my wife and I have to become friends. Because when Xander leaves the house, we still have to live together. And I have failed her in that specific situation. Because I have allowed the ministry to even overtake my wife. That's not fair. That's not okay. I married her. She agreed to marry me. Choke was on her, but I'm telling you what. <laughs> I tricked her. I did. I really did. I pulled the wool right over her eyes. No, I'm just playing. I did. <clears throat> but we're so big ministry, we don't have time to be friends. We don't have time to have relationship with each other because we're so busy all the time doing all the stuff of the ministry. And I just looked at her yesterday. I was like, we have got to spend more time together. We're not spending time together. And there is nothing more powerful. Somebody said, well, you don't have a lot of time, Pastor Jared. I don't have a lot of time. But it's not about quantity. It's about quality. So from now on out, I'm going to post on the members only page. Not taking any phone calls unless you're dying. At a certain time. I better not get texts, messages, or phone calls. Amen. Call Brother Earl. <laughs> and he never carries his phone, so you're just out of luck. Because God's going to send in a lot of young couples, a lot of, and he has been, and he's going to continue to. Our church needs to be a reflection in our homes of Christ. Do you know that in the kingdom, that even the bells that are on the horses will say holiness to the Lord? Yes. Even the dishes yes. that will serve what we will eat in the kingdom will say holiness unto the Lord. It's absolutely true. Let's go there. I think it's in Zechariah, but I could be wrong. It is Zechariah 14. Close. Thank you. Zechariah 14 and verse 20. That's the reason why our houses should be clean. I'm telling you. And all you pack rats that think possession <laughs> makes you valuable, you need to do a purge. You need to get you some tubs, put some stuff in it, and take it down to Goodwill. Yeah. Amen. If you can't make it through your house over stepping stuff, but I need it. I need it. I need you ain't opened that in five and a half years. Don't even play with me. You don't even know what's in that thing. Throw it away. This is a good barometer. If you haven't used it in the past 12 months, you don't need it. I do need it. No, you really don't. Well, what if I do need it? You can go buy it. Amen. I need a bigger house. No, you just need less junk. (laughs) 
In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. And the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judea shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. So if that, if what we're doing now is preparing ourselves for the kingdom of Jesus Christ, you think there should be dirty dishes piled up in your kitchen? Amen. Praise God. There are probably dishes down there you hadn't seen in a long time. Bless the Lord. Amen. I didn't even know. Where did that come from? I don't know what happens in our house, though. We don't increase in dishes. We just lose forks. <laughs> I think it's Xander throwing them away in the trash can. I think it is. Or it's under his bed one, praise God. I don't know. He's hiding it somewhere. We can't keep forks in our house. There is like a demon of, of theft that, that eats spaghetti in our home. I'm serious. That needs a fork for everything. But should our homes not say holiness to the Lord? Yes. Pastor Jerry, but I don't have a lot of money to fix it up. I didn't ask you to fix it up. I asked you, is it clean? If I was to walk into any of our houses today or any of us were to walk in each other's house, could we walk in there and say, this is holiness to the Lord? And if not, then it's time for us to make those necessary adjustments to make sure that it can I'm not talking about, amen. Y'all know that one room you shut the door on? Tell the company, you can't go in there. You hear me? You can't go in there. Amen. We got our fifth child in there, all right? He's a rabid dog. You go in there, he'll bite your head off. No. Even in that room, <laughs> there should be holiness unto the Lord. It's time to get our homes in order. As men, it's time for us to get our lives in order. It's time for us to, as sisters, to get our lives in order. It's time for us to get our children in order. Amen. Because you know what's going to happen? That little monster that you've let be a monster is going to go to school. They're going to pull him out and give him a diagnosis. And they're going to start medicating what you refuse to discipline. But even in disciplining our children, there should be holiness unto the Lord. God never, thank God, he never disciplines me in his hot anger. He doesn't. I've never had God discipline me in his hot wrath. Because it's never been about retribution for him. It's always been about growth and maturity and discipline for me. And when God chastises his children, it is for our benefit, not for his. The Bible said we had fathers after our flesh who, when they disciplined us, they did it for their benefit. But when he disciplines us, he does it for our benefit. And so your child may act up and it may make you angry because you're human. Don't ever, ever discipline your child while you're in your hot anger. Because you're going to go overboard. You will turn it from discipline and you will start going overboard and get retribution. You will not talk to me like that. Well, it's not necessarily that they talk to you like that. It's that they disrespected authority. So don't take it personally. Discipline the disrespect to authority. So if you have taken it personally and you're angry, go and calm down. But then come back and discipline. All right. I'll stop here. We really need to get order in our homes. When people walk onto our properties, when they, when they come into our homes, I don't care. Listen, it doesn't have to be a three-story house. It could be a one-room apartment. But it should say holiness unto the Lord. Come on, somebody. Our bathroom should say holiness unto the Lord. 
Amen. Our basement should say holiness unto the Lord. Every area of our life should say holiness unto the Lord. Because we're preparing for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you something, saints, and you men better hear me very clearly. I am going to become far harder on men that are irresponsible, that will not work, and that are childish than I've ever been in this ministry before. Because it is my job as your pastor to get you to a place where you are a reflection of Christ to his church on how you treat your wife and your family. Sisters, I'm going to be as hard as I can be, but then I need some of our church mothers to step up to the plate as well and say, we're not going to keep our mouth shut. Listen, the church I was raised in, there were women in there that didn't keep their mouth shut. And if they saw a woman failing, they didn't just watch her drown. They went and they issued proper correction, proper direction. They helped them. They trained them. Sister Opal is gone, sisters. Sister Donna is gone. Mimi is gone. These mothers of our church are gone. Now you're it. You older women been serving God for a long time. You're it. You're the mothers. Now, when we have young women that come in this and you see that their children are not kept. Well, they'll get offended at me. Let them get offended. It is not our job to keep them from being a, their feelings hurt because they don't want to accept correction. You look at them and say, sister, when you bring your children out in public, they should be washed. They should be cleaned. When your children, when they're playing in the mud, let them play in the mud. My goodness, and you, you, you got boys, take them out and roll them in the mud. Find a mud puddle and just. Praise God. They shouldn't be walking around dirt like. <laughs> hey man, you go out there and get some mud, put it in the water, and just smear it all over them. <laughs> or send them to Brother Justin's. <laughs> Let them slap some hogs and beat some chicken and come on, somebody. All right, he said it's going to happen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. I want everything about our homes and about our lives to say holiness unto the Lord. And so, mothers, I need you all to step up now. Take your rightful role. Those who won't receive correction will never receive correction. But there are going to be some mothers coming here and say, I don't know how to do this and I don't know, I don't know where to look to get it done. Well, where can they look? Older women, teach the younger. We can't demean them and look at my God. Ugh. If we're not willing to confront it. Confront that. Sister, this should not be. This is not appropriate. This is not right. This is how the word of God tells you to teach your children. To take care of your children. And then us brothers been serving God for a long, a long length of time. God word in us. We're going to have to father. Well, they'll get offended and won't take it. Can't help that. If they won't receive correction, they don't belong to God. That's what the Bible says. They don't even have a father. But there are going to be some young men coming here that are saying, I don't know how to do anything. I don't know how to be a man. I don't know how to be a husband. I don't know how to be a father. I don't know nothing. I didn't have no father in my life. And if my father was in my life, he was absentee doing his own thing and didn't care that I was there. This is the generation we're dealing with and that the church will not step up and take care of it. The world is going to pervert everything in their life. It's our job. And we need to get, get it taken care of. Amen? All right, we're going to take up our offering.
tithes and offerings. This has been a great message tonight, saints of God. I'm not tooting my own horn, but God has spoken to this place tonight. Church mothers, step up. Fathers, step up. Let's be what these young people need us to be. Amen. Praise God. And God will be glorified in everything that we're doing. Amen. If you've got your tithes, your offerings, I'm just trying to see if there's any prayer requests that I haven't seen on the live stream. But if you've got your tithes and your offerings, let's bring them before the Lord. Let's stand on our feet. Let's ask the Lord blessing this, a blessing over this offering. And let's give as the Lord has given to us. Father, we thank you so much. For this honor and opportunity, we have to take what little, God, you have asked of us and bring it to you, God, in recognition and gratitude of what you have given us in abundance. Lord, I pray tonight for this offering. I pray that you would bless it abundantly. I pray, God, that you would bless those that have to give. God, watch over your word to perform it concerning them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right. Brother Chris, come. Let's get this offering. Amen.
I don't think any of us are at that place. I don't think any of us didn't have room for improvement as we heard the word of God come forth. So we're, we're thankful. We're thankful for the service because it helps make corrections in our life. Helps tune us. Helps to get our compass back right. So we should thank God for services like this. We should, we should be shouting. We should be jumping up and down actually because God loved us enough to send a correction. To send the word of God to touch our lives. To help us that we might be more like him. So as we go out through this week, we're going to pray here. Ask the Lord to help us that we might be that representative. When the when people look upon our lives, what do they see? How are we representing? I thought that was so good. How, how do we represent Christ? Each and every day. It's like the, what was there, <coughs> commercial where the man would be smoking a cigarette. <laughs> Now, son, I don't want you ever these things because they're... <laughs> but we need to represent Christ. Our children learn. Our families learn. The community learns by what they see more than by what they hear. Amen. So let's just pray and ask God to help us throughout this week, the rest of the week, and throughout the rest of our time upon this earth to represent Him. More. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so appreciative of the Lord. The word of God is a come forth, O oh, Heavenly Father. How you touch the pastor here tonight, giving us words, O oh, Lord God, that we might truly, O oh, Lord God, bring our lives and our homes into order, O oh, Lord God. Help us, each and every one of us, O oh, Lord God, that we might see through the scripture, through the word of God, O oh, Heavenly Father, areas that we might draw better, draw closer to you, O oh, Heavenly Father. Let us glorify your name by our actions, by our order, O oh, Lord God, and by our discipline. God, and serving you, oh, Heavenly Father, in every way of our life, oh, Lord God. Let it be a glory and an honor and praise unto your name, O oh, Heavenly Father, that we might glorify you. In Jesus' precious name we pray.